Today we will learn and reflect on Pericles, the great general of ancient Athens, and the start of the Peloponnesian Wars, the Great War of Ancient Greece, the 30-year war spanning two generations that many historians compare to our great wars, and that's World War I and World War II. This is the second video in the first set of videos where we examine both the history and Plutarch's moral biographies of the key Athenian leaders before and in the first years of the war. In the first video, we reflected on Pericles and his reforms leading up to the radical democracy of Athens in the years leading up to the war. And afterwards, in the final set of videos, we will examine both history and Plutarch's moral biographies of the key Athenian and Spartan leaders during and ending this first great war of history. Alcibiades was a leading character both in these wars and in the Platonic Dialogues, including the Symposium and Alcibiades I. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in our PowerPoint script posted to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. We'll begin our discussion with Pericles as general of Athens as the war clouds gather above Greece. Plutarch says that as a military commander, Pericles was famous chiefly for his caution. He was never prepared to join battle when there was considerable uncertainty and risk, nor did he admire and model himself on those commanders who were acclaimed as great, but who enjoyed brilliant good fortune at the risk of their own lives. He was constantly telling his fellow citizens that if it were up to him, they would remain immortal forever. Plutarch continues, Pericles kept curbing the impetuosity and pruning the restlessness of the citizenship. He tried to divert most of their resources to guarding and securing what they already had. Plutarch tells us that Pericles was a competent but careful general, that because of his successful military campaigns, Pericles showed his enemy that he was a man to be feared, and his fellow citizens that he was a man of action, and yet could keep them safe, because the troops who took part in the expedition suffered no setbacks even as a result of chance. Well, Durant speculates, in 459 BC, Pericles, anxious to control Egyptian grain, sent a great fleet to expel the Persians from Egypt. This expedition failed, and thereafter Pericles adopted the policy of Themistocles to win the world by commerce rather than war. This was a major defeat. The Athenians lost over 200 triremes where the water that they had sailed into was drained. Thucydides dryly notes that this was the end of the great expedition against Egypt made by the Athenians and their Delian allies. Professor Harl says that the defeat in Egypt caused many problems for the Athenians. The apparent invincibility of the Delian navy was shattered. Sensing weakness, many city-states revolted. It took time to put down these rebellions. This led Pericles to avoid far-off entanglements in the future. Around 460 BC, Sparta experienced a severe earthquake, which killed many of its citizens and soldiers. Some scholars speculate that Sparta never really recovered from this population loss. The slave class of Sparta, the Helots, and the free residents, the Perioikoi, revolted at this time of crisis. The Athenian general Cimon suggested that the Athenian army offer their assistance to the Spartans. Like many aristocrats, he considered the Persians to be the true enemy, not the Spartans. But it had been 20 years since the Greco-Persian Wars. Memories were fading, and the Athenians had been triumphant against the Persians, adding their former Greek colonies back into the Delian League. Soon after Cimon arrived in Sparta with his army, the Spartan assembly got cold feet, fearing that the Athenian democratic enthusiasm would infect the Spartans. So they asked Cimon and his army to return to Athens. This incident humiliated the Athenians and led to the ostracism of Cimon. From this time afterward, the Athenians were more hostile towards Sparta. About this time, the Greek city-state of Megara, which controlled the key mountain passes from the Peloponnese to Attica, faced a conflict with Corinth and appealed to Sparta for assistance. But Sparta was totally distracted by the destruction of the earthquake and the resulting Helot slave revolt. Sparta did not devote the attention needed to the Megarians, who surprisingly then sought to join the Athenian Delian League. 
Some years later, they revolted against the Athenians, who then retaliated with the Macarian Decree in 432 BC, placing a near total embargo on Megara, who then appealed to Sparta, and this was another cause of the war. And we know this embargo was effective because the Greek comic playwright Aristophanes, in some of his comedies, constantly referred to the starving Megarians. Later, when Euboea revolted from Athens, Pericles sailed over to the island with an Athenian army. Then he received news that Megara had revolted and that the Spartan Peloponnesian army were at the point of invading Attica. The Athenians under Pericles defeated first the Spartans, then the Euboeans. After these battles, the Thirty Years' Peace was negotiated by Pericles between Sparta and Athens and their allies in 460 BC. This peace would be interrupted by the Peloponnesian War. Under this peace, Megara was readmitted back into the Peloponnesian League led by Sparta, which was important because Megara controlled the mountain passes leading into Attica. Now, if you look on the map, the city of Corinth is located in the narrow piece of land that's the gateway into the Peloponnese. Corinth and Sparta were allies, as there are always tensions between the Corinthians and the Athenians. Well, Durant tells us it is probable that Pericles, who had not hesitated to conquer the island of Aegina, had dreamed of completing Athens' control of Greek trade by dominating not only Megara, but Corinth, which was to Greece what Istanbul is to the eastern Mediterranean today, a door and key to half a continent's trade. The war may have been partially caused by the growth of the Athenian Empire and the development of Athenian control over the commercial and political life of the Aegean. Athens allowed free trade there in time of peace, but only by imperial sufferance. No vessel might sail at sea without her consent Wilderan continues, The resistance to Athenian policy came from nearly every state in Greece. Some subject cities and others that feared to become subject appealed to Sparta to check the Athenian power. The Spartans were not eager for war, knowing the strength and valor of the Athenian fleet, but the old Athenian custom of establishing in every city a democracy dependent upon the empire seemed to the land-owning oligarchy of Sparta a threat to the aristocratic government everywhere. For a time, the Spartans contented themselves with supporting the upper classes in every city and slowly forging a united front against Athens. Surrounded by enemies abroad and at home, Pericles worked for peace and prepared for war. The army, he calculated, could protect Attica, or all of Attica's population gathered within Athens' walls, and the navy could keep open the routes by which foreign grain might enter into the walled ports of Athens. It was his judgment that no real concessions could be made without endangering that supply of food, and it seemed to him, as now to England, a choice between empire and starvation. Thucydides, in a sentence, explains much history. The Peloponnese and Athens were both full of young men whose inexperience made them eager to take up arms. And the Peloponnesian War commences. The struggles between Athens and Corinth provided the spark that ignited the Peloponnesian War. But first, let's explain the term colonies. In modern history, colonies are subservient to their mother country. But in ancient Greece, this was not necessarily so. Greek city-states would send out colonists to found cities in distant lands. And although these colonies had a degree of loyalty to their mother city, they were independent city-states, and sometimes these colonies turned against their mother city. The two incidents that sparked the conflict between Athens and Corinth involved two of her colonies. The Corinthian colony and Corsaira on the west coast of Greece allied with Athens, and they fought and won a naval battle against Corinth, which Corinth argued violated the spirit of the Thirty-Year Truce. Then Athens interfered with the affairs of her colony Potidae on the west coast of Greece. Potidae also paid tribute to Athens as she was part of the Delian League, but she was assisted by Corinth when she came into armed conflict with Athens. The Spartans had already determined that they were going to go to war with Athens. However, they wanted to consult with their allies, and the Corinthian delegation urged on the Spartan assembly to declare war. Athenian representatives who were in Sparta for other business also wanted to speech, and Thucydides coins their speech. This speech not only reflects how Athenians remember their history, but the gratitude many Greeks felt when Athenians won key battles against the Persians, preserving Greek freedom in the Greco-Persian Wars. This gratitude was the main reason why, many years later, when Sparta wins the war against Athens, the Spartan commander Lysander does not destroy Athens, slaughtering their men and enslaving their women and children when Sparta triumphs in the war many decades later. 
These Athenians addressed the Spartan assembly. This is our record. At Marathon, we stood out against the Persians and faced them single-handedly. In the later invasion, when we were unable to meet the enemy on land, we and all our peoples took to our ships and joined in the Battle of Salamis. It was this battle that prevented the Persians from sailing against the Peloponnese and destroying your cities one by one. The Athenians continue, Surely, Spartans, the courage, the resolution, and the ability which we showed then ought not to be repaid with such immoderate hostilities from their Hellenes, especially so far as our empire is concerned. We did not gain this empire by force. It came to us at a time when you were unwilling to fight to the end against the Persians. At this time, our allies came to us of their own accord and begged us to lead them. It was the actual course of events which first compelled us to increase our power to its present extent. Fear of Persia was our chief motive, although afterwards we thought of our own honor and our own interest. The Athenians concluded, Finally there came a time when we were surrounded by enemies, when we had already crushed some revolts, when you had lost the friendly feelings that you used to have for us and turned against us and began to arouse our suspicion. At this point it was clearly no longer safe for us to risk letting our empire go, especially as any allies that left us would go over to you. And when tremendous dangers are involved, no one can be blamed for looking after his own self-interest. This proclamation Thucydides credits to the Athenians is prophetic. On one point we are quite certain. If you Spartans were to destroy us and take over our empire, you would soon lose all the goodwill which you have gained because of others being afraid of us. Think of the great part that is played by the unpredictable in war. The longer a war lasts, the more things tend to depend on accidents. Neither you nor we can see into them. We have to abide their outcome in the dark. And when people are entering upon a war, they do things the wrong way around. Action comes first, and it is only when they have already suffered that they begin to think. Thucydides observes that the Spartans voted that the treaty had been broken and that the war should be declared not so much because they were influenced by the speeches of their allies, but because they were afraid of further growth of Athenian power. At the Allied Congress at Sparta, Thucydides says the Corinthians proclaim the reason for their hostility towards Athens. War gives peace its security, but one is still not safe from danger, and for the sake of quiet one refuses to fight. As for that dictator's city Athens, which has been established in Hellas, let us make up our minds that it is there to dominate all alike and is planning to subdue what has not been subdued already. Let us then go forward and destroy Athens. Let us be able to live our own lives in the future without fear, and let us liberate the Hellenes who are now enslaved. Plutarch writes that the Spartans invaded Athica, laying waste to the land. They assumed that the Athenians would not let them get away with this, but would be prompted by anger and pride to fight them. But the idea that they should join battle in defense of their city with 60,000 Peloponnesian hoplites struck Pericles as outrageous. He proceeded to pacify those who were spoiling with the fight and were upset by what was happening, arguing that trees soon grow again even when they've been hacked and chopped, but that it is not as easy to recover men once they have been killed. Thucydides tells us that Pericles suspected that the Spartan general Archidamus, who was his guest friend in Sparta, might possibly not lay waste to his estates and houses like those of other people. So he proposed to the Athenian assembly to give them up and make them public properties so no one should have any suspicions against him. Plutarch says, Pericles refused to convene the assembly since he was afraid of being forced to act against his better judgment. Instead, as the helmsman of a ship called an open sea by a strong wind stows everything safely away and draws the ship's sheets tight and then relies on his skill rather than paying attention to the tears and entreaties of the seasick and terrified passengers, so he battened down the city and thoroughly secured it with guards and then relied on his own judgment, showing scant consideration for the outcries and complaints of the discontented. Why was Pericles successful in selling the citizens of Athens on the strategy that, when the Spartans raid Attica, the Athenians retreat behind their walls, with the city providing them grain shipped in through their ports, where they watched helplessly as the Spartans torched their fields, smashed in their houses, year after year? 
Indeed, many Athenians were itching to put on their hoplite armor and confront the Spartans. And they had defeated the Spartans in prior hoplite engagements. And it was also the Athenian hoplites that routed the Persian infantry in the Battle of Marathon. When the Spartans invaded Attica, although the Athenian hoplites did not face them in direct combat, the Athenian cavalry did harass them. While the Spartans ravaged the Athenian countryside, the Athenian hoplites simply marched between the long walls that connected Athens to its ports, and boarded triremes to ravage the Peloponnese lands near the coast, and harassed shipping in the navies of Corinth and other Spartan allies. Professor Harl argues that though the evidence was indirect, the Spartans and their allies suffered as much, if not more, as the Athenians in this period of the war. Also, olives and grapes were the main crops of Attica, and it is difficult to kill an olive tree. The branches and the vines can simply grow back. These slides on triremes and hoplites are from our video on the histories of Herodotus, where the Greeks battled the Persians, where we have an extended discussion of Greek combat on land and on the sea. And in conclusion, Sparta only committed about two-thirds of its troops to these annual invasions of Attica in these first years of the war. These invasions usually lasted only about 40 days because the Spartans had to go back and make sure the Helot slave population did not revolt in their absence. After the first year of fighting, the Athenians held their annual commemoration of those warriors who died in battle that year, and there Pericles delivered his famous funeral oration, which we cover in a separate video. During the second year of the war, the crowded conditions behind the wall of Athens caused the outbreak of the plague that killed a quarter of the Athenians. Here, Thucydides juxtaposes the high-flying declarations of the virtues of democracy with the terrible degradation of society caused by the sufferings of the plague. Most of Pericles' relatives and many of his supporters also died of the plague. The angry voters blamed Pericles for both the plague and the war and voted him out of office. Then they had second thoughts and re-elected Pericles, but by that time he was too weak to be effective. Soon thereafter, Pericles himself died from that plague. And these were the two strategies that Pericles urged to win the war. Avoid battling the Spartans and Hoplite formations in Attica, because if they lost, they would lose both their city and their whole empire. In recent Hoplite battles between Athens and Sparta, sometimes Sparta won, sometimes Athens won. Avoid extensive overseas adventures like the Egyptian ex expedition, where they had lost over 200 triremes. Could the Peloponnesian War have been prevented? Scholars debate this question. Due to Sparta's rash actions, they discredited the Athenian general and politician Cimon, who was trying to broker peace between Sparta and Athens. We mentioned Cimon and the confusing 50-year gap between the two wars. Plutarch has a biography for Cimon. This will be featured in a future video. Another misconception, as Professor Harl discusses, is that the societies of Athens and Sparta were radically different as the Cold War societies of the Free America and Communist Russia. In fact, many old histories try to make that comparison directly, but this causes a problem, because Sparta won the Peloponnesian War, fought to liberate the Greeks from the democratic Athens. Professor Harl argues that the Athenians are not that much different from the Spartans. Both had popular assemblies, as did most aristocracies in Greece. The main difference was that in Athens, the ordinary citizens dominated the assemblies, whereas aristocrats dominated the assembly and the aristocracies. Also, all of the Greek city-states had warrior cultures, although Sparta took this to the extremes. He also argues that the difference between Sparta and her Helot slave population and the other Greek city-states is overdrawn. We suspect that many other city-states in Greece also had large slave populations to tend to the farms, though we know very little about the other city-states of Greece. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Since all of our videos on the Peloponnesian War access many of the same multiple sources, we cut another video reviewing these sources. All of these sources are a joy to read. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. 
Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.